Friday. I'm happy to introduce our ground round speaker for today, who's Dr. Axoy. Really needs no introduction, but uh, just a little background. He joined UCLA in 2013 after completing his a general uh, cardiology, interventional cardiology fellowship at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, see, since then, he's been an integral um, part of UCLA, uh, doing interventional cardio, um, interventional services, uh, consult services, and CCU services. Uh, he's been cherished by the fellows and house staff alike. Um, here, he currently wears multiple hats at uh, UCLA, including uh, being an associate professor of medicine, associate director of um, aortic valve therapies, and uh, associate director of clinical research and interventional cardiology, uh, involved in multiple trials. Um, he specializes in structural interventions, including TAVR and MitraClip, and has really brought uh, the TAVR program from uh, its infancy to its successful program that we have today. Um, so as fellows, I know we're always very uh, uh, we always eagerly await your update to the TAVR program um, each year and, and are excited about the new developments you're going to tell us about. So I'll turn it over to you now. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Axway. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. So I just want to sort of go over the overall the aortic stenosis from the beginning to end, really, because this is, a, of course, a field very important, not only important to cardiology in general, but also there's been a lot of developments really over the last decades since I, when I was in training. And now we're at the 10 years into the TAVR program at UCLA. We've done over a thousand cases now. So I think there's a lot, a lot to learn from these procedures and but we're still learning on a daily basis. So from a disclosure standpoint, we have run a bunch of trials at UCLA. We are still enrolling in a number of trials. So if you have anybody with, you know, partner three was the low risk trial that we're uh, following up really that trial is closed. Uh, unload is, low EF with uh, moderate aortic stenosis. There's a complete trial that's pending uh, IRB right now for revascularization of our patients. So, so any, anybody, please, we're always interested in research and enrollments, and please let us know. But really, uh, today's topic is uh, what is aortic stenosis? And we'll sort of go over what causes it. There's a lot of ripe opportunities for research here, also from basic science to the clinical side of things. Right? I find the basic science stuff very fascinating. But then we'll talk about the clinical presentation and the, uh, what the prognosis is. And then, of course, we'll need to talk about the uh, treatment options, which go from medical management to surgery to, of course, cover. So this is really what we were talking about. Uh, this is, you know, uh, really the one on the right, which is the cadaveric model, which is that, of course, the blood will come through the left atrium, through the mitral valve, the ventricle will squeeze, and it needs to push out through this aortic valve into the aorta. And really, you want that valve to be nice and thin that is seen on this left panel. So basically, you know, you see that three leaflets here, there's a very thin, you can sort of almost see through, you know, you shine a light behind this, and you'll be able to really see it uh, nicely. And compare and contrast that with this one on the right panel, which is, you can see the very thick uh, leaflets, and there's three of them still, but there you can see calcific nodules and really a uh, fibrotic material. So you can imagine that this is going to uh, give you a lot of resistance to opening up, and so it will increase pressures. What are we talking about? What is the scale of this problem? Well, it's estimated that in at least 7% of the people over the age of 65 will have this problem. And it's more likely to affect men than women, but uh, uh, you know we see quite a few uh, females with this as well. But 80% of the uh, adults with symptomatic AS are male. What are the major risk factors? Uh, it's increasing age of male gender, like we talked about, but it's hypertension, hyperlipidemia, elevated LP little a was, even has been associated. Of course, smoking begets calcium. You know, any inflammatory condition, even you know, uh, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, has been associated, and also uh, even osteoporosis because there's some link, of course, between calcifications or uh, you know, calcification of the vasculature, also which then correlates with the uh, aortic valve calcification as well. So, what uh, are the other sort of general things that we think about beyond the uh, basic science of it? Is that you may be born with a congenital uh, abnormality which would be uh, the most common being, uh, uh, being the bicuspid aortic valve. And here you see a, a figure here is the bicuspid aortic valve. This is seen in about 2% of the patients in general in population studies, although uh, exact number and percentage probably uh, is unclear, but about 2%. You can have rheumatic fever growing up, so that can cause some AI and AS, and uh, it'll basically thicken a leaflet there due to ongoing inflammation. And of course, the more common one, which is the age-related calcific aortic stenosis. And really, when we talk about this, you know, the, in the good old days, it used to be, you know, oh, you know, it's wear and tear, the valve is just getting old, and of course, it's getting thicker, et cetera. But of course, it turns out there's a, there's a mechanism behind all this. 
And the more we study it, the more fascinating it gets because it's really similar to the coronary artery disease pathophysiology. The, if you look at the, at the molecular level and histology level, they all correlate. So there's this initial insult to injury, the leaflets, as opposed to the vascular endothelium, you know, in the coronary case, you get oxidized LDLs, the monocytes come in, turn to macrophages, et cetera, and the fibroblast, collagen deposition, you name it, are very similar things we know from coronary disease. And ultimately, at least to calcification. And then uh, and in that, you know, there's uh, bone morphogenic proteins, there's osteocalcin, there's a lot of, uh, you know, activity that you also see in the bone tissue as well. So ultimately this progresses and I uh, guess to a severe stage and that's when we really start seeing patients. So it's really a lifelong process in some ways, but, you know, usually we think about this as starting in the forties, fifties, I guess. Although you think about it, you probably all our lives sort of lead up to this to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, you essentially get this latent period where the valve is progressing slowly and you get a uh, gradual increasing of structural myocardial overload. And ultimately, this leads to symptom, symptoms. And symptoms are one of three, as you know. Uh, uh, this is uh, anginal symptoms, syncopal symptoms, and heart failure. In that order, it gets worse, the survival is. So really, when you look at all these patients, if you present with shortness of breath or heart failure symptoms, and patients have different presentations of this, they can say, I'm short of breath. I can't lay flat. I don't feel like I have enough energy. Uh, you know, I'm tired all the time, those sorts of things. Of course, if we're in a 75, 80 year old patient, the differential is broad, but you, if you have a valve problem, sort of uh, lowest hanging fruit, so to speak. But if you don't treat these patients, approximately 50% of these patients with severe AS will die within two years of experiencing symptoms. If you have heart failure, just, just about everybody's gone at the end of two years. And unfortunately, we have seen some patients over the years, you know, that has really been hesitant and uh, uh, doing any interventions, and we really have seen some patients pass as they're waiting, uh, waiting this out, even though we uh, highly recommend them to go ahead with some sort of therapy. So what are the symptoms we're talking about? Well, we went over three of them, but what is the pathophysiology that's behind all this? What is What are we really talking about? So is, if you see on this, uh, uh, on this graph here or figure here, Essentially, because this, this is a normal uh, heart, uh, you will have normal aor aortic pressures, and then this valve is opening and closing easily without, because it's, again, it's that nice and thin and pliable leaflets. And so there's no real gradient difference from LV to the aorta, so then your LV pre filling pressures do not need to be elevated. And compare that with the aortic pressure here, which may be okay, but if you have high resistance here, the LV needs to generate the pressure enough not only to uh, support the aorta, but also it needs to push the blood through that thickened aortic valve. To be able to do that, if you remember from strength, styling curves, et cetera, you will need higher preload. So this is where this whole preload conditioning, preload dependent condition comes from. So when your LVDP is elevated to be able to generate that uh, pressure and thickening of the myocardium, then that also translates back into the left atrium and left atrium and back into the lungs. That's when you get this congestive heart failure symptoms and that's fluid overload, et cetera. But you're also going to be getting uh, anginal symptoms because, again, you have higher uh, filling pressures. Whatever you're seeing measuring on your arm is not really how much your heart is working. It's working a lot more than that. You're really living in this constant hypertensive state as far as the ventricle is concerned. And, of course, you have uh, higher filling pressures. Again, another reason for angina. But, of course, the uh, last thing is syncopal symptoms or lightheadedness, dizziness. Because you're losing a lot of this pressure in this aortic valve, Imagine when you have a fever, imagine when you didn't eat and drink enough, you went out long, you know, mowing the lawn, et cetera. Maybe your LV is empty now enough to the point that when it loses these pressures in the aortic valve, your aortic pressure drops to 80s, 90s ballpark, and that's when people get lightheaded. Really nice and clear explanations to why people get symptoms from it. Well, what about what, what are the options then? Well, now we know that this valve is potentially lethal and it wants you to get into severe aortic stenosis territory. But what can we do about it? Well, it, number one thing is, is it preventable? So a number of medicines have been tried. Given that statins uh, uh, work in coronary artery disease, there's been a lot of excitement initially for the statins to use. You know, it's anti-inflammatory, and maybe it will lower the LDL, lower the oxidized LDL, et cetera, stop that cascade early on in the process. Other things like ACE inhibitors, bisphosphonates have been tried. Really not much has come out. So just to go over some of the uh, statin data, Initial excitement on rosuvastatin. This uh, came out in really early 2000s, and then when they looked at this, uh, they compared uh, placebo with rosuvastatin. Looked at the aortic valve area. They noticed that actually the yes, the valve progresses, you know, but then uh, uh, 
when you have to take statin, maybe you can attenuate this progression. Now, in this case, it doesn't look like a big, big change, but it's just a year, year and a half really follow up. P value was significant. So there was some excitement that maybe if we give our patients this rosuvastatin or statin early on, that we can progress, you know, slow down the progression of this. So several more studies were done. It was saltire came out when I was in uh, residency, actually. And then uh, they looked, compared atrovastatin with placebo. And this one, the p-values, I mean, the curves were pretty overlapped, essentially. That was really discouraging. And then more study came out, one more study came out, astronomer study. Uh, and then they looked at aortic valve area change from baseline and rosuvastatin did not show any benefit over on top of placebo. And the final nail in the coffin was the CEASE trial that came out in internal medicine, I think when I was a fellowship. And really, when they compared the mean change in aer peak aortic jet velocity, they did not see any difference. So that sort of put the, you know, ended this whole statin discussion. Although the arguments are, if you look at these studies, a lot of these patients had moderate uh, AS. And so maybe if we start earlier on, you know, maybe we can start, you know, nip it in the bud basically too early on enough that maybe we'll get make a difference. But that sort of excitement is not there anymore as much. So some ACE inhibitor studies have come out, uh, small 20, 30 patients that didn't really show, uh, it, while it showed some benefit in, in larger study, it didn't show any change. And we looked at the bisphosphonates because of the calcium and how calcium affects you know, the bone. Is it going to keep the vascular uh, or the aortic valve calcifications from happening? But we couldn't really show any benefit. You know, This was 10 years ago, one of my fellowship projects. We also looked at renin angiotensin system, and we looked at this was that ACE inhibitor sort of excitement that I had during fellowship. We uh, presented as an abstract in the ACC back 10 years ago also. It didn't really show any difference in terms of the valve progression uh, in the 208 patients that we looked at over about five years. And some things that did come out though, I mean, this was interesting. This is again, one of my fellowship things that I looked at calcium supplements and vitamin D in somebody who already uh, has aortic valve replacement. And we did see actually that if you already have an aortic valve replacement in place and you take calcium D and vitamin, calcium and vitamin D supplements, it's, it, it is that your valve actually may be getting worse faster. So you need quicker aortic valve uh, uh, replacement, a redo surgery, essentially. So this sort of was a concerning event. And then this was followed up, actually, uh, in Cleveland, again, seven years, uh, or rather, yeah, six years after I left, they actually looked at native valves. And there is a signal, in fact. They looked at uh, patients more than 60 years of age with mild, moderate aortic stenosis. And then if patients are noted to be taking vitamin D or calcium supplements for at least one year, they propensity match those patients who are not taking calcium D, uh, calcium and vitamin D supplements. And they did in fact show that the valve progression is quicker, meaning worse. So vitamin D and calcium supplements may be playing an adverse role, making it worse actually for the aortic valve progression. So something to keep in mind, I tell my patients, if you're just taking it, just because your neighbor is taking it, that's probably not a good reason to take these supplements. You know, but everybody wants to take vitamin D with the COVID and everything too, although now the studies are, are more negative than anything else. But you know, people like their vitamin Ds and calcium supplements, but if you're deficient, by all means, please take it. If you have osteoporosis, and the data for osteoporosis and vitamin D is also questionable, but if you have tested and there's some, you know, you, you feel, you know, vitamin D levels are low, by all means, please take it, but don't take it just because it may have an adverse effect on your cardiovascular health. And that's also true for coronary disease as well as uh, um, other studies that we know of. So what are the medical recommendations for medical therapy? Well, I mean, really not anything obvious other than the usual medical care that we provide. So really a class one recommendation in patients with at risk for developing AS and asymptomatic AS is treat the high blood pressure and just titrate accordingly. Well, that, that we should do anyway. Another class one uh, finding is statin therapy is indicated for primary and secondary prevention of atherosclerosis in patients with AS. Okay, well, we do that already. Uh, and then I'll go to the uh, class three, which is that statin therapy is not indicated for the prevention of aortic stenosis. So we have data that says that it's, it just doesn't do anything. And now this 2B thing is a tab related. Uh, there was one paper that I was involved in actually out of fellowship also. What we looked at renin angiotensin um, system blockers. And if you have TAV, actually, if you have uh, uh, surgical AVR, that there's an association of ACE, uh, ACE inhibitors and ARB that reduce the progression of the valve uh, to get worse. So it actually preserves the valve, maybe add more years to the valve that's already there that you put in. So those are, that's sort of the general medical recommendations. 
But then let's make a diagnosis of aortic stenosis and then see what else we can do in terms of you know, treating this problem uh, because we know that the medical treatment doesn't really work as much. So how is it diagnosed? Well, uh, this is sort of a classic slide that you know we can, depending on where you are, you can look at the chest x-ray, hard to see. You can do an L a a EKG and you'll see some LVH. Uh, MC changes may be related to that. You can auscultate a murmur. Uh, that's the one that you always talk about, late peaking, crush under the crush under murmur. You can do a cardiac cath, which is invasive, but really the gold standard, most, you know, vast majority of patients will get diagnosed with an echocardiogram. It starts with a murmur and then at least an echo. Most of the time, that's enough information to make a diagnosis on this. Occasionally, we have to go to the angiography and the cross the valve invasive measurements, but really more often than not, echocardiography is uh, enough, more than enough. So, so what are the criteria by echocardiogram? So jet velocity more than four meters per second. Uh, we look for a mean gradient of uh, 40 millimeters of mercury or the valve area less than one uh, centimeter square would be a diagnostic of severe. Now, the one issue is that none of these criteria are matching up. So a lot of times we see patients who have valve areas of 0 0.8, 0 0.9 and their gradient is 25. 30, let's say. So then while the mean gradient is in the more moderate range and the valve area is in the severe range, and then what? So some, that is some diagnostic dilemmas that we can talk about. There's other tests you can do, dobutamine, et cetera. Is it low flow? Is it paradoxical low flow? Is there severe mitral regurgitation? LVH, what, is the, what are the reasons for having low gradient? There's always up for discussion. We always debate these, these things every time we see a patient. But really, gradient is flow dependent. Valve area is a little bit less flow dependent, and jet velocity will also be flow dependent. So, so you have to sort of look at the entire picture. Sometimes we look at the morphology of the valve and how much calcium there is, which has some place in the guidelines as well. And one last thing on echo is that you, it's important to calculate aortic valve area index. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, for a bigger person, their valve area may be bigger for them. It may measure 1.1, 1.2, but you're talking about, let's say, NFL or NBA player, they may be a lot bigger than you. And for them, the aortic valve area index may be less than 0.6, then for them, it may be severe AS. So it's sort of all relative, so you need to normalize the body size. And it's important to make the right diagnosis because once you have severe aortic stenosis and you don't really treat it, you, the five-year survival is pretty horrendous. I mean, it's comparing um, compared to other some of the other malignancies, you're looking at three percent five-year survival. So it's as bad as, as as bad as it gets. So it's important to to make the diagnosis and really jump on it. And the reason for that is that aortic valve replacement is very effective. So this is a case series that where they looked at patients who had symptoms, no symptoms. And also, the AVR and aortic valve replacement, or they did not have aortic valve uh, replacement. The red lines here are the worst of it is a, you had aortic, you have symptoms, you did not get replaced, you did not get fixed, get that uh, surgically fixed. And this, as you can see, is almost nobody's alive after a uh, couple of years. And then immediately, as soon as you get the valve surgery, your uh, prospects look much better. So, really, the improved survival rate with or without symptoms ends up being uh, improved by 40% or so if you have severe AS. So this makes the aortic valve surgery, aortic valve replacement standard of care. And because of the increase of risk, uh, risk of sudden death, uh, aortic valve replacement should be performed really promptly after the onset of symptoms. So we don't wait around for two years or one year. You know, And when we see these patients in clinic who have severe aortic stenosis and they have symptoms, we, tell, we don't tell them, oh yeah, let's see how you're doing and come back in three months, come back in six months, let's see how things are. We tell them we should get the ball rolling, get the process started. So how is the surgical approach done? Well, there's two options. So we'll get into the, some of the guidelines in a little bit, but there's a mechanical valve and there's a hypostatic valve that you can use. Uh, uh, they all have their own benefits and risks. But I'll go over a case here that uh, one of my patients actually showed up in fluid heart failure to clinic. His EF was dropping to 30% or so. He couldn't, he couldn't barely um, you know, sit in my clinic. He was really short of breath. So we admit him to the uh, hospital through the emergency room. Really, in a few days, he ended up getting his uh, valve replaced. This is like, I think, 2014, 2015 ballpark. This is what it looked like in the surgical, you know, in the operating room. They had a bicuspid valve, uh, and then it, it was taken out, and ultimately a new valve was placed. And now you can see that this is, valve is nice and thin. So then I still see him. Uh, I think it's been like seven, eight years now. He's just complaining that he's now starting to get a little bit of shortness of breath, seven, eight years out of surgery while he's playing tennis. 
his EFS fully recovered and he's doing fine actually, generally speaking. And valve is okay, he's just, I think he's just more knee pain, more than that. anything else is what he's having. So the surgery is great, you know, it makes people live longer, feel better, we know that, but the studies show that at least 40% of severe aortic stenosis patients are not treated with uh, any uh, surgical intervention. And that has a lot to do with many risk factors, but you know, as we look at the risk factor levels, uh, we use this SCS score, which is not perfect, but SCS score is defined as, you know, risk of death after surgery at 30 days. So your SCS score is, let's say, 8%. Uh, we say the 8% risk of mortality at 30 days, essentially. So, and when people look back at this and in the trials, this 8% and over was defined as a high-risk cohort. And there's an inoperable cohort, it's just not surgical candidates, like patients like cirrhosis, or it's like third time reduced surgery, fourth time reduced surgery, et cetera. There's a futility. I mean, if somebody has, uh, let's say, uh, a number of factors go into this, but they're bed bound, they have stage four cancer, and they have advanced dementia, et cetera, some of these things are not, uh, you know, uh, the patient will probably not derive too much benefit from replacing the valve. And then there's the intermediate risk category where it's defined as 4 to 8% risk at 30 days after surgery, and there's less than 4% is considered to be low risk. So really, based on these risk factors and based on frailty, based on malignancy, based on a number of factors, about up to 40% of the patients were not getting uh, this replaced surgically. So when I was a resident or a fellow, we used to tell patients, you know, unfortunately, we don't have much to offer you. If you're high risk, you won't survive the surgery. And so please just sort of go home and spend time with your family. And that all changed though, thankfully, uh, because uh, it's not a great situation that you're sending patients home. Especially like curative product, cure that potentially you can cure this aortic stenosis, uh, but you just cannot offer it, offer it because the risk of the procedure is too high. So people have tried a number of things. So the first thing that was tried was this um, surgeon actually in France, which sort of was involved in towers as well later on, they tried balloon aortic valvoplasty, go in, inflate a balloon, sort of crack the commissures, and then get more of an opening. And then uh, you get out, and the valve is that. So it's the same thing as doing a PTCA ballooning of the coronaries, essentially. But this is limited by restenosis. So you're getting 80% restenosis rates at one year. So very limited. I mean, you can balloon and balloon and balloon, but you know those patients, ultimately, there is no survival benefit because you're also accumulating risk of procedures. If you look at the case series uh, with balloon aortic valvoplasty, 6% rate of mortality if you do a balloon valvoplasty of this valve. So imagine you do it and you do it again, you do it again, ultimately, unfortunately, it's not a lasting solution to this problem. But then this uh, came, this Anderson valve came. So this is kind of interesting. I met the guy, I met the guy actually, he's from Denmark. And he, you know, the, if you look at the coronary history, ballooning for the coronary started in about 78 or so. Bare metal stent started in 1988. So 1989, this guy is early, you know, young attending. He says, "Why don't we stent this uh, aortic valve?" And you know, nobody believes him. But he ultimately uh, designs this thing. And he takes like a, a wire in his kitchen, and he just folds it to a certain extent. He sutures this valve uh, at his kitchen on his kitchen table, sort of thing. Puts it on this balloon and puts it in a pig. And that was in 1992. And he actually comes in presents in a, a you know, conference at the ACCHA meeting. And really, this is actually him uh, in, in, when he was presenting this thing. And basically people walked, he, just talking to him, he said, you know, people came in and they didn't even, you know, they just walked past my um, this, uh, stand basically the way he was trying to present his, uh, what he did. Nobody even talked to him because they thought this is the most stupid thing I've ever heard. Actually, as we were declared, declaring, as we were deploying the valve today, just a half hour ago that, you know, our surgeon was saying, you know, if you asked me 20 years ago, I would just laugh at you if you said that this is something like this wasn't going to work. But here we are, that he dealt with it in 1992, actually, at the ACC conference. And then he was then sort of like, went home, he's like, what am I going to do with this thing? But then, you know, thankfully for us, he kept going. So he worked with Dr. Kirby A, actually. And ultimately, lo and behold, some finances, some company bought them out, et cetera, et cetera. They ended up fine-tuning this valve and turning it into what you're seeing on the screen and put it in a patient who actually has uh, EF like 10%, essentially, 57-year-old guy dying from cardiogenic shock. And they said, okay, well, this is sort of a compassionate use. And they put the valve in the patient. 
And the valve works beautifully. So the guy actually, the patient does well, and he lives for three, four more months actually, and then he dies because he gets septic ultimately. But the, the whole point was that the valve actually worked fine. He got out of this cardiogenic shock situation, clinically improved, and sepsis is sepsis, is sepsis. he's sick, I guess. So, but then that's the proof of concept that was published in circulation in 2002. And then of course, there was this mad rush of, okay, well, how can we do this? You know, and multiple more trials were done. So in this day and age, we have, technically, we have three valves on the market. There's one Sapien 3 Ultra. There's actually a newer generation that just came out. Sorry. Newer generation just came out. And uh, uh, they have this Resilia tissue uh, now, which is sort of the surgical tissue that has the, um, that has the um, anti-calcification treatment used in surgical valves. So we were about to switch to that actually pretty soon. There's this Evolute Pro valve, which is a self-expanding valve that's made out of, you know, the outside is nitinol frame, inside is the pig tissue, it's made by Medtronic. And then there's Lotus Edge valve, which was marketed by Boston Scientific. Um, this is actually a pretty great valve too. It's, uh, it's a trial body because he had very high pacemaker rates and it was really the third valve on coming onto the market. But they really didn't get much market share, so to speak. So they sort of thought that they're not gonna be successful with this valve and they actually ended the production of this thing. So that sort of is auto commission. We're back down to Sapien 3 and Evolute Pro. And these are two valves available in the United States along with, you know, experimental things going on with different types of valves. But in different parts of the world, people are come up with sort of local versions of different types of valves, which is, you know, every every company is trying to build up, come up with something uh, if they can. So just that uh, I didn't go with the Sapien 3 Ultra. So basically, Sapien 3 Ultra is made out of cobalt chromium. And then inside of this is a cow tissue now. Again, they have a look for pig. This is cow tissue. And then um, there's a skirt here that's, uh, that's uh, used to reduce the uh, paravalve So those are the two valves that are in use in the US. And here's a video of the procedure. So essentially, um, you know, we look at the blood vessels and if they're big enough, we go from the groin. Most cases that we do are from the groin lately uh, because it has associated with the best outcomes essentially. So you go and you cross the valve and this is a balloon aortic valve plastic I was telling you about. You, Pace the heart at a rate of 160, 180 ballpark. You inflate a balloon, sort of make a, make some room uh, for the valve to come in. We still do the ballooning in certain cases that I will have to say that we've gone from almost 100% use of balloon aortic valve plastic pre-valve deployment to maybe 5%, 10%. What we know is that there's a risk of every time you're manipulating the valve, with whether it's wiring, ballooning, et cetera, you're increasing the risk of stroke and getting in more trouble. So what we do is we go in with this valve then, uh, you pull the balloon onto the valve, and this way you're able to lower the profile so that you can actually put the valve system uh, into patients with uh, smaller blood vessels. And then you're sort of negotiating this valve around the arch, and you can imagine that there's a risk of stroke associated here. So then uh, you bring it down, you, again, you're sort of articulating the, the top of this uh, delivery system, and then you bring it down onto the valve, into the valve really, and uh, really, you then pick and choose where, how high you want to deploy, how low you want to deploy. You always are wary of the coronary heights. We're always wary of the uh, how much calcium there is on the annular level, risk of rupture, how calcifies the valve, how high are the coronaries, those sorts of things. And we, of course, carefully measure the valve size on the CAT scans, and ultimately you pace and you deploy the valve, and that's what it is. And this is really uh, literally how it's done. So as soon as you develop, you deploy the valve, uh, again, the valves don't know anything. They're not automatically wired to open and close during systolate acetyl. It's a matter of pressure, really. So when the LV contracts, uh, then you generate a pressure higher than that of the aorta, aorta, and the valve will open. And then when the pressure drops during diastole and the LV, the uh, valve will close. That's really, uh, the, so the valve really starts uh, working immediately. Now you see that there's the coronaries on the sides and then you see that the old valve is sort of pushed to the side. So, so the, you're still leaving the old valve behind on this one. It's not fully really a replacement of the old valve. It's more, the rest of the world is called TAVI. Here in the US it's called TAVI. Really. So here's one of the ones that we did. This is from a couple of months ago. This is one that happened to have low coronary height. So you can see here that we have a, we have a, a, a guide catheter and we have a stent in the LAD. And then here's the pacemaker wire, here's the valve. And then we deploy this valve uh, with the pigtail. You can see why we protected the coronary, because the coronaries are pretty, uh, 
coordinates are little on the lower side, but also root is pretty small. So you can see what the problem could be here in that you could be occluding the uh, uh, coordinates here, really, right? Because the valve will actually cover the origin, but the valve itself is not usually a problem. It ends up the, the valve behind, the native valve may rise up and actually occlude the coronary. So this patient ultimately did okay. So, but that's how it's done, uh, essentially. Well, what about data? So if you look at data, this is now old news, but it's, um, this is how the valves got in the market. I think the way that the tower got rolled out in this country is in the world actually was very, very nicely done because it was all based on literature and it was all based on data. So initially, uh, they took this partner 1B trial. There's 1A and 1B portions of this. 1B is the one are the ones. Uh, 1B is the group of patients who are inoperable. So they were left with medical therapy, uh, which included actual balloon aerobic valvoplasty and Lasix. Really, essentially, those are the things they could do. And then they did the valve. And we actually enrolled in these in this trial when I was a fellow. And we'd go in and tell them that you randomized the medical therapy, and which is really unfortunate. And then you know it's really sad because tears come down, you know, because you know that medical therapy doesn't work. But what this, this show, uh, what the, this study did show is that, you know, in the inoperable patients, if you do medical therapy versus you actually do the TAVR study, 25% absolute risk reduction at two years. So this actually was pretty impressive. Number of treat is basically four, right? It says we don't see this type, sort of data in medicine anymore. That's 1B, so I put the uh, tower on the map. And then they compared, um, as part of the study, high-risk patients, that was defined by STS score, which we talked about is more than 8%, so 30-day risk of death state. So they compared surgery and tower, and then uh, this is with the first generation valves too. And what they found is that it's basically in high-risk patients, your, uh, your death, uh, death from any cause for all patients basically overlapped. Transcat for death from any cause in the transfemoral looked a little bit better for transcatheter early on, but they caught up. So really mostly overlap. And then uh, if you look at the combined endpoint of death from any cause of major stroke, really overlap as well. So really now you have an option for these patients of high risk uh, patients, surgery versus TAVR. You can do a less uh, you know, invasive method, uh, no open heart surgery, and you can basically get similar outcomes for death and stroke. And that was with the first generation. So this then, you know, led to uh, published in 2010 and 2011 and led to ultimately, you know, approval of this valve uh, in the United States. But what's going on the Medtronic side of things, on the core valve side of things, they actually did this similar study in high-risk patients. And then their endpoint was one year all-cause mortality. And they, in fact, did show that p-value is 0.04 for superiority. So basically, they showed that cavity was better than surgery in their own study. So which was uh, a little bit unexpected in some ways, but actually a welcome finding out today. So then that, that the low risk cohort got, um, the high risk cohort got approved and then we started doing TAVRs and that's sort of when I came to the, uh, you know, UCLA 2013, the TAVR program here was about one year old, so 20 miles in at that point. Uh, and then, you know, then the, the partner two trial got started and because the high risk cohort where the question was answered, then uh, the partner two study looked at, uh, you know, patients who are moderate risk, and that's defined by 4% to 8%. And they randomized about 2,000 patients. They looked at trans-apical, trans-aortic cohort on this side, but really were more interested in this transfemoral cohort, and they randomized to surgical AVR and transfemoral cavern, and uh, looked at mortality and disabling stroke at two years. And this is the intention to treat analysis when they looked at it. They saw that uh, you know uh, maybe numerically tower is better in the intention treat analysis uh, in terms of mortality and disabling stroke, and then as as treated analysis uh, again this sort of similar findings, but within when they actually focused on the transfemoral cohort because that those first two graphs were from like all comers, but when they focused on transfemoral cohort at two years you actually have death mortality and stroke wise you have a p-value of 0.05, that's in favor of TAVR. So really TAVR better, essentially, with a significant p-value. Oh, borderline, but significant. And then the uh, same thing uh, on the as treated cohort, p-value is 0.04, They're really 4%, and if you look at the absolute risk reduction, 4% like on TAVR side, two years. So this, this, was, uh, this sort of established TAVR, again, as a alternative to surgery, with possibly better outcomes, and this is, at this time, using the second generation valve, that's Sapien XT, actually. And then when you look at the vascular, a little bit more, the fine print, uh, more vascular complications with TAVR, but really less bleeding, 
less AKI and less uh, onset of new onset of atrial fibrillation and tower patients. So a number of things are better as well on top of death and stroke uh, combined endpoint. If you look at the mortality at 30 days, uh, you're talking about all-cause mortality 1.6% and cardiovascular is 1%. And if you look at stroke, all strokes were 1.4% and disabling strokes were 0.8%. So really kind of impressive numbers. Another thing that happened while they were doing this uh, this, this uh, partner two study was this third generation valve came out. So they compared a very sort of did ran a very similar sort of parallel trial where they did Sapien 3 and compared that with the surgical arm on the partner two. And they, they uh, really looked at the similar outcomes. It's essentially sort of a study outside of a study, but really the same endpoint, same enrollment criteria, same everything, and just with a newer generation valve. And when they looked at 40 day, uh, uh, sorry, uh, when they looked at 30 day mortality, surgery versus tower, they found that 4% mortality with surgery and 1.1% tower. And that differential actually persisted out to 12 months. So that actually was in favor of tower. And then they found something similar 30 days, 4.4% stroke versus 1.0% stroke in tower, again, in favor of uh, uh, tower procedure. So because of these types of data, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the, in 2016, FDA approved the expanded indication uh, for both the Medtronic valve and also the Edwards valve, which is Sapien 3 and the core valve uh, for the intermediate uh, indication uh, for patients uh, with aortic stenosis. So then we were part of this partner three study. <clears throat> this is the Loris trial now, but now we're coming to more sort of modern day uh, and they looked at low risk patients, and this was defined by risk uh, less than STS score less than 4%, transfemoral only cohort compared TF TAVR with surgery. There were a number of, uh, you know, uh, there were a number of registries involved by CUSPID and TA and alternate access and valve valve registries. The endpoint was uh, all cause mortality, strokes, and rehospitalization. Really, this is the endpoints that was published in, I think this was 2019 at this point really three years ago, this um, uh, age was younger. So I didn't go over the details of partner one, but in partner one, that was uh, age was 84. Again, STS score more than 8%. And then this one, age is 73 range and the STS score is 1.9. So really truly low risk cohort. And the overall fealty was these patients were excluded. So these are patients who are 70 years old basically, and they're uh, not frail. They're actually in pretty decent shape with low STS scores. And when they looked at the outcomes, it again, it came out in favor of TAVR. If you look at the combined endpoint, you can see that's 15% versus 8.5%. That's really p-value is pretty significant. If you look at death from any cause, uh, this crosses the you know, confidence intervals of one. So this wasn't uh, this didn't show ma any major significance, but also the similar finding stroke is in favor of TAVR. Uh, confidence interval ends at one. So not significant, although close. And rehospitalizations uh, uh, was also sort of crossed as I guess one is the upper end of confidence interval. But if you take it as a unit, as a as combined endpoint, it was significant. So that was the um, that was the Edwards uh, Sapien three valve, and then uh, the similar study came out for the Medtronic uh, core valve. They looked at similar endpoints, seventy four year old patients in this one, STS score of one point nine. They really showed uh, similar findings uh, in that death and disabling stroke tower look better in general uh, in these patient subsets as well. So these are some of the more details. Uh, again, uh, you know, it's just similar findings with as far as death and stroke, it's all sort of going in the right direction. So ultimately, August of 2019, we ended up uh, getting approval for low risk patient, you know, uh, indication for the uh, tower procedure. One warning sign I do have to say is so now in this day and age, we have approval for all comers to do TAVR. So that means that you could, if you really wanted to, there's no really, it's hard to stop you for a 30 year old, 35 year old, you know, do TAVR. Of course, we don't do any of this stuff, but if you really want it, I mean, it's, there's no clear exclusion criteria for younger patients to get TAVRs and such, but that, that should be, be still thought of very carefully. And we'll go over this, some of the guidelines. And part of it is this, because this warning sign came out. So this is really our five years after partner two study, which is the, again, remember this is the moderate risk cohort. And the valve duration, they looked at how the valves are performing, valve areas are similar, gradients are similar. So the valve performance is pretty good, actually. If you have moderate to severe uh, PVL, you did worse, but if you have mild parallel leak, it was not actually that significant. But if you, uh, 
if you look at the sort of this combined endpoint of death or disabling stroke, this was concerning to me. Three year mark, you know, in the beginning, tower looks better, but at three year mark, surgery sort of crosses over. And actually, there may be some significance if you follow these patients out to 10 years. And this may not make a difference for your 80, 90 year old, but if, some, if you're doing these things in younger and younger patients, this may be significant ultimately as the curves are separating a little bit. So we don't have any more recent data than this. And the P value, again, overall, over the last, over the five year time frame, this P value is not significant, of course, uh, 0.21. So that's sort of the general whirlwind tour of this, uh, where the data, everything else stays. So then let me sort of go over the um, guidelines now. Uh, so uh, I just want to go over the timing of the intervention because we always debate asymptomatic, high risk, et cetera. So what did the guidelines actually say? Well, one, uh, class one level of evidence A really is that uh, in adults with high, severe high gradient aerobic stenosis, they have symptoms uh, that we talked about. AVR is indicated, that's clear. That's clear. In asymptomatic patients, there is a couple of criteria actually still. So in asymptomatic patients with severe AS and injection fraction is less than 50%, AVR is indicated, that's also a class one recommendation. In asymptomatic patients, um, this is 2A now, if you have very high velocity, meaning if you have five meters per second or higher uh, velocity, and they're felt to be surgical low risk, AVR is also reasonable. And this came out from a New England Journal of Medicine paper from Korea, actually, about two years ago. And uh, these are 2020 papers, so let's follow that paper. And then also, in apparently asymptomatic patients with severe AS and low surgical risk, you can look at the BNP, and that's more than three times normal. And you may have a case for making, you know, the uh, valve replacement. That's 2A. And finally, 2B, this is one of the weaker ones, but because some of the maybe the echo uh, measurements may be a little bit off and, and different on different measurements. But if you have a progressive decrease in the ejection fraction, at least three serial imaging studies to less than 60%, AVR may be considered. That's sort of the timing of the intervention uh, uh, guidelines. But if you decided for surgical AVR, I think this makes a difference. If you, are, you have a patient younger than 50, years of age who do not have a contraindication for anticoagulation. They really recommend, it's class 2A, but they really recommend a, a mechanical valve prosthesis, prosthesis, essentially, if you're younger than 50. That's sort of the guideline. Now, every patient will be a little bit different, and you may choose, you know, your cutoff may be different, but the guidelines say 50. And also, if you're over the age of 65, then uh, if you require AVR, then maybe better to choose bioprosthesis because uh, you don't want to deal with human in essential 65-year-old. And this comes from, uh, all this information comes from the fact that if you put in a bioprosthetic valve, 15 years of needing a reoperation is different in younger patients, uh, higher likelihood of that valve getting worse on you. And if you're older patients, if they expect to survive in the United States in this day and age, for men is 78, uh, for women is 81, they got worse with COVID even. So if you look at all these things, uh, it would be very reasonable to put a uh, bioprosthetic uh, valve in 65 and over age. And then what about TAVR versus SAVR? So, so again, uh, going back to it, if you're younger than 65 years of age and have a life expectancy more than 20 years, and you don't have kidney disease, you have lung disease, liver disease, et cetera, which feels like most of our patients, at least it's a referral center. Uh, but if you don't have any of those, no major comorbidities, maybe you should do SAVR. That's uh, uh, class one recommendation. But if you're over the age of 80 and you don't expect to live more than 10 years, there's a number of uh, comorbid issues, then maybe TABR is best. That's a class one recommendation. And anybody else between you know 65 and 80 years of age is sort of up for discussion. Although I will say in practicality, in real life, you know, uh, patients do not want surgery ultimately. And you, we look at the numbers, we look at comorbidities, and really, uh, we're, for the most part, we're all offering uh, a lot of 65-year-olds, unless there's anatomic exclusions, calcium or low coronary heights, et cetera. We usually do offer TAVR, I have to say. And then uh, a couple other things that the guidelines did mention. TAVR is recommended for symptomatic patients if you expect them to live more than 12 months, even if they're kind of on the higher risk. But if somebody is not expected to live more than 12 months, you think they're advanced dementia, bed-bound, infected, cancer, et cetera, then maybe there should be a family discussion of you know, what really the goals of care are. So those are the general numbers, and I'll sort of close to wrapping up here. Basically, what are the what have you seen over the years? Wallens or TAVR really have taken over the SAVR procedure, uh, standalone SAVR procedures. If you need cabbage, that's a whole another game, all another discussion. 
But what are the limitations of the literature so far? We don't really truly know how long these valves are good for. Uh, we have data up to uh, seven years at this point, and it looks like the valves are uh, sort of uh, doing well and compared to the surgical valves. Uh, we need to still work on optimizing procedures, special valve and valve and coronary access issues, and that needs to be thought of for lifetime management. Can always reduce risk of complications, although they, I should say they were in pretty good shape. And then there's the unanswered question is, what do you do with concomitant CAD? What do you do with aortic uh, insufficiency? What do you do with bicuspid valves, et cetera? So how has UCLA done so far? Well, so here's sort of, it was starting 2012, and this is the literate data from 2015. We have come up to, we finished last year with 150 cases. I think we we're like, uh, we're on par to get 180 this year so far. Uh, we initially, we, it was all general anesthesia, SWAN, and, you know, it's the full-on uh, monitoring uh, A-lines, et cetera. We switched since uh, the Sapien 3 came out, actually, which enabled less PVL and less invasive procedure. So we actually switched to moderate sedation in 2015. It's now seven years, essentially. We did our first transaxillary case now four years ago. We have done that transcarotid case about a year ago now, and we've done a number since then. And we really went past uh, a thousand cases about six months, uh, more than six months ago. So, so I think this program has matured into something pretty good, I would say, you know, as far as, far as rankings and et cetera is concerned, UCLA gets, you know, top rankings for the UCLA, uh, for the Tower program, those full scores, everything. So I think it's recognized nationally as well. And part of it is due to this finding, which is that if you look at our in-hospital mortality rates, we haven't had major mortality in the last, you know, uh, for a while. So outcomes are actually pretty, pretty good. And this is despite the fact that we're doing SDS scores on average about six or so, actually. So typically after the lower score came out, our numbers came down also, but we're still doing plenty of moderate to high risk scores uh, due to, you know, cirrhotic patients or, you know, the reject, you know patients who were rejected for tower from other centers uh, that we end up doing here. And our stroke rates are also pretty uh, minuscule, I would say. So, uh, oh, this is something that we're really proud of, actually. Uh, Taver, oh, I want to go back. This is uh, uh, pacemaker rates. Uh, this is actually we've done. We've sort of coordinated with our electrophysiology colleagues. We've done some some electrophys EP studies in the cath lab while we were doing the valves and actually working on some publications for this. But really. We've been able to take down the pacemaker rates to 0.8% about a year ago, and then we had a number of patients at 3% last year. National average for pacemaker rates are about 7.7%, actually. We're significant, we have been significantly below those numbers for many years, uh, actually. So it's something that uh, we always like to uh, get excited about. As far as access, so transfemoral access versus other access, you can see that in the early days, uh, Transapical access were actually relatively common. It's almost 50-50 uh, back in the day. The reason for that is that the catheters were big. It's 22 French, 24 French systems. Now we're down to 14 French, 16 French systems with the you know the new generation valves. So really we've gone up to 98% transfemoral access, and now we're sort of going. We're alternating between transcarotid and transaxillary access in a number of cases. Uh, so uh, mostly transfemoral, and that's also helped by the fact that we, the shockwave device is something that we use in the early accident that's been helpful as well. As far as the conscious sedation, as we mentioned, 2015, we switched back, so we're doing 85, 90% of the cases are conscious sedation. Uh, we do get uh, patients who, you know, who do we intubate then? I mean, those patients, actually, if you have severe lung disease, we really try not to intubate uh, because then that could be a problem. But the patient that we end up intubating, if we're worried about low coronary heights, if we're worried about obesity being a factor or sleep apnea and obstructing during surgery, we've done a number of patients who have BMIs like 55, 60 uh, ballpark, and those patients will be intubated still. So we're at the 85, 90% ballpark in terms of uh, doing conscious sedation. But you know, we're lucky to have some of the best you know, anesthesia colleagues that work with us. And really, this is what it comes down to. You know, you're seeing the surgical, uh, what happens after surgery, and you're seeing that's my finger. Really, I mean, this is what we're going through this little area here, and really, this is invisible after really a week or two. You don't really know something happened in the groin, and that's a pacemaker wire on the other side. So this is what this is about. And what are we in terms of research uh, component of the program? We're enrolled in partner three. We're still, you know, uh, following some of these patients uh, in clinic. 
on no trial, again, if you have any patients with moderate aortic stenosis and injection fractions less than 50%, please let us know. Uh, we have another trial coming, the complete trial that uh, we'll do in there. You know, we have done a number of papers you know, over the years, but I do want to give a shout out to actual last uh, year, actually, this, this is especially special, I think, because this was, uh, these uh, papers were driven by really uh, John Holloway, who was a fellow at the time uh, that actually really single-handedly took this paper and which actually kind of a practice changing paper for many places. I think we looked at single versus double purpose, technical things and the tower side things. So this was really uh, uh, great to see for one of our fellows to get a first, you know, first authorship in a major, uh, major journal. And then the, this one came out about like a week, two weeks ago, actually. Uh, the uh, the impact of frailty and mortality and the quality of life. So we showed in this one, thanks to Eric and his mentorship with uh, our medical students and residents as well, they show that frailty matters more than you know having cancer really. You could have cancer, but if you're a robust uh, patient, then actually you still derive significant benefit from tavern. It's the frailty that matters uh, that really makes a difference in this patient. So with that, I will just also say thank you to the rest of our team, Dr. Akandi, Dr. Robani is on the interventional side, cardiology side, Dr. Shiman, Dr. Kwan, Dr. Banaraj, our anesthesia colleagues, uh, Kumal and John has been uh, amazing. And of course, Eric and Sam now uh, is uh, playing a big role. But the, really, this program wouldn't have been the same uh, without Jeannie and Maria, who joined us in the last two years. Uh, that really has been the heart and soul of this program. So with that, I will uh, uh, finish and uh, I'll take any questions and we can have a discussion. Thank you. That was a great talk, uh, LJ. Um, what's going on with the increased uh, TIAs or strokes late on in the TAVR versus SAVR? Are those occurring in patients who had paravalvular leaks or is there, uh, what's the signal there? Right, so most of the strokes happen actually in the first uh, procedure related strokes will happen in the first. And from what I've since I will tell you our experience, which is that we usually see if we see anything, it's rare, but we see it, it happens in the first day. So uh, everything is fine. We send the patient upstairs or to the PACU and then, you know, lo and behold, every once a year or something, then we get a call that patient is something is going on with the speech, et cetera. So that's in the first day. It probably has something to, to do with the embolism uh, during the procedure, uh, which there's filters, et cetera, are being developed. I mean, there's new literature you, you may be aware of that just got published, actually. And just a couple of weeks ago, the presentation was at the TCT. The filters, while it does not reduce total number of strokes, uh, it reduces significant strokes, but then the numbers are very minuscule. It's like the, risk, the reduction in major strokes are like 0.8%. This is minimal. So the filters are unclear what to do with the filters still. Uh, but that's sort of the uh, uh, procedure related strokes. But when people looked at actually the 30 day and sort of longer term follow up, They've seen things like atrial fibrillation, you know, the associate, you know, as with associated. Uh, what I always worry about, actually, what that partner two study made me worry about is that, you know, we're leaving the old valve behind. So there's always this concern of what if the pieces of calcium are there or you form a little trauma there. So there's always this debate about what the ideal, you know, the, as do we do aspirin, do we do aspirin plavix, do we do more blood thinners for a couple of months? And different institutions have different practices. As far as like prevention of strokes long term, there's not too much else really. You know, this is check for AFib, check for uh, uh, check for like you know the anatomic things that you may have caused during the procedure, but those things are far and few in between. That we don't have any major adjustable factors, but AFib is one. It came that came out as one of the biggest one. The PVL PVL risk, I mean, it probably adds it touch of increase to the stroke risk, but stroke risk is really like one, 2% you're talking about. So maybe it increases by point something, 0.1% if you have like mild PVL, which hasn't really borne out to be a major risk factor in the studies. I don't know if that answers the question, but I mean, the, the, the filter thing is big and uh, the study for the, was for the combined endpoint was negative for all strokes. Uh, are, are we uh, going to be using that filter? 
we haven't been using it. Uh, and honestly, the, the, the thing with the filter is that you, while you're putting the filter in, you could be causing uh, strokes as well because the, you're scraping the aorta as you're trying to put the filter in. I think that's part of the problem. But the combined endpoint of like all strokes is negative. Uh, so, but the major stroke like is reduced by 0.8%. So it's, I don't, it's, I don't know, we're debating it. I'll be honest with you. Uh, but if you use it in all comers, everybody, then that's one thing. Uh, if you use it in what you think is high risk and high risk patients end up being like bicuspid valves and valve mouth cases, and uh, maybe use it on those patients. But it's really, I don't know, we're debating amongst ourselves, actually. The literature came out. So it's unclear, but we haven't swapped back to uh, using the filter. So if you look at the... Uh, uh, so the combined in the, in the United States, majority is like about 90 plus percent of the patient, uh, population, the, the fiber programs are not using filters uh, rely, like uh, all the time. I mean, most have access to filters and most have used filters. We have used filters. In some cases, we have used filters in patients, some valve and valves. Uh, we have had patients who had left atrial thrombus, appendage thrombus. We had apical, actually we did some tabers on patients who have apical thrombus you know, is, and then we use filter on that and that worked out fine. But I mean, uh, routine use of filters is pretty rare uh, in the US. Occasional PRN is the high risk use is uh, more common. And that's sort of what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jay, can I ask you a question? Yes. This is Jesse. Uh, I wanna just thank you for developing this program and also uh, taking the lead on getting us uh, able to get our VA patients uh, taking care of at UCLA, uh, which is, I think, important for us and especially for our fellows since they're their patients. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and uh, really impressive development of this program, um, you know, over the last five years. Um, is there any role for getting uh, the Medtronic valve? We're always debating that, actually. I think we're actually, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I think so there is so the, there's the practicalities of it. There's the ups and downs of it. So basically, I do think that we will be getting it in the next couple of months. We're actually talking to Medtronic, and also amongst team. I think we all feel that we should have a second valve on the shelf. Uh, now, the, as far as the specifics of the Medtronic valve is, uh, and I a lot of you guys know this, but the problem with the Medtronic valve is that there's a few things. One is um, pacemaker rates are very high. So it's as opposed to like a 3%. Now we're like, you know, we had 0.8% last year, the last in the year before. Uh, and then the last year was 3%. So uh, as soon as we put start putting in Medtronic valves, our pace rates are probably going to go to temper. So that's something that's, I think to me, that's important. The number two thing is the coronary access. So now we're doing younger and younger patients. So if I put a Medtronic valve in, uh, in a patient who's 60 years old, and then the, the, the way that valve is designed is as a supraannular valve, meaning the valve leaflets are actually higher than the annulus. If that's the case, that's a problem for coronary access. And if you do that for a young patient in their 60s, let's say, and they need a valve and valve in 10 years from now, let's say with the last 10 years, and then you put a valve inside of that, with a valve and valve, you're going to almost certainly want to obstruct the coronaries. So that or that patient comes in in five years' time, they're having semi not semi something now how are we going to get into the coronaries that's even a bigger problem so these are issues that there were some that we're sort of struggling with the other thing is that if you have to get an open heart surgery and remove this valve and put a new valve in and the removal of these taver valves are very challenging and if you look at the actual you know redo surgery after taver the, the patients really do poorly because the expertise and the sort of challenges of removing the valve that's already sort of buried into the aorta is a kind of a challenge so in general, the, what is the benefit of the Medtronic valve is a few things. One, if you have a, a small annulus, so typically, you know, it's just it's simple and brings like only pi r square. If the if we measure the aortic valve area, it's 314, you, you know, you're good for, you know, you do the pi r square, the diameter is going to be 20 and radius will be 10. But if you have somebody, let's say, who has a tiny aortic root and they have a tiny aortic annulus and you really don't want to put a tiny valve in because you know that you're going to get patient prospective. Core valve would be a great valve for that because then you have a higher, you know, supraannular valve and you're going to get more of an effective orifice area. 
And that's one uh, sort of particular use. The other particular use would be a valve and valve cases where you're putting in, it's like a 21 valve that was placed years ago. And now inside of that, you need to put a tiny valve and then you're gonna have a, you're gonna come out of the uh, cath lab with a gradient of 20. If you put a sapien in like a 20 valve and you put a 20 in a 21, et cetera. I'm not going into the fracture and the valves, et cetera, but really it's going to be a higher gradient. So because of those things, they're putting a super annual valve have some advantages and I think I, we do want to bring in the uh, uh, Medtronic valve, uh, but we would probably use it only for patients with very small annuli and also uh, a valve and valve procedures where they have a small valve to begin with. I think those that would be a niche indication. But outside of that, I mean, I think that as a first valve for a younger patient, I think Sapien 3 is better uh, for coronary access and also sort of gradients are sort of relatively similar anyway for the, uh, if you have a big enough uh, valve or effective orifice area, you can put a big valve in, Sapien 3 is fine. Alternative for uh, a small, uh, you know, annuli are uh, basically taking the patient to the operating room, do a root enlargement, and then they get a, this expandable surgical valve, biopsthetic valve, and then you, then, then you can go in and put that expandable, you know, put a sapien in that, and then it will stretch out the frame that's specifically designed for TAVR anyway. So the bottom line, I think, is that it's complicated. There's ups and downs to either valve. Uh, I think the ups of the uh, uh, Edwards system and, or the sapien system is a lot more than the Medtronic, but Medtronic is the niche indication. So we'll, I think we'll have it in the next couple of months. Olsey, I was going to say on top of your stellar leadership in this program, um, kind of going back to the core valve, you know, uh, sapien sort of divide. Um, I'm wondering, like, if your your EP work with the EP group, kind of looking at EP properties. Again, full disclosure, I'm not involved in that project, so I don't know the details. But you know, do you think you could potentially risk stratify risk of pacemaker with that? I mean, it's a very unique project, and that could provide a lot of TAVR groups with guidance on. If you suspect someone with, let's say, you know, the right bundle branch block or someone who's at high risk for conduction disease, and they have the choice of two devices, and obviously putting into other things like coronary heights and other things like, you know, that could be a, a way to kind of help figure that out. I agree with you that you probably get better hemodynamics in, let's say, valve and valve or, you know, prior, prior device therapy, but, uh, you know, Right, I think. I don't know if you're allowed to comment on. That. I don't know if you're allowed to comment on that or even comment. No, no, on no. There's no IP stuff. I mean, it, but I mean, even if there were, but I mean, the the thing of it is that I think it's uh, it's actually really important. I think this is very timely, and UCLA is uniquely positioned because this shapes project where he has this anatomic, uh, you know, uh, you know, the really outline of pictures and stuff he's been taking. So we've been working with like his fellow, you know, Shunpei, and then um. We've been measuring, you know, the uh, the membranous septum. So the membranous septum. So it's interesting. If you look at the literature, the membranous septum is in the left. So there's the AV node, compact AV node, the his bundle, and it comes over to the left side. And seventy percent of the time, the left bundle actually is on top of the uh, muscular septum, just at the bottom of the membranous septum where they meet. So that's about seventy percent. Small proportion passes through the membranous septum, and a small proportion passes through the um, actual the muscular septum. So you can sort of find out about that way if you do, you know, his bundle, you know, if you put a his bundle, his catheter and find out about that. But also if you sort of guesstimate based on your uh, the depth of the membranous septum as compared to annulus, you can get a feel for, you know, how, how safe you are in most cases, because again, 70% are going to be running in the, um, the top of the uh, muscular septum. So, so it's helpful to do these things. It's helpful to uh, come up with uh, scoring systems or you know, risk factors, et cetera, uh, for the Medtronic actually very useful. But I think that, you know, like clinical practice wise, I mean, ultimately, you know, it ends up being about you know, how high the valve is. You know, no matter, I can argue it's high, low, it's I can argue this membrane septum is long, short. Ultimately, you have to have a landing zone. And ultimately, uh, the landing zone is too low, you're going to get close to the left bundle. And if it's high, then you could run the risk of embolizing. But then you put it as high as possible and still stay within the annulus. I think that's what we've learned and done over the years is that we aim for 90, 10, almost 100, zero in the number of cases, especially if patient has a, a right bundle to begin with. And if we're gonna pinch that left bundle, 
and we end up actually uh, uh, putting it 100, 0, 90, 10. And as a result, we even had like quite a few patients actually with you know, bifascicular blocks, et cetera. And they, told, they go home without pacers. And we've been following these patients for many years now, actually. I mean, so that's one thing. Uh, the one thing that the, uh, so the Medtronic guys have been applying the same sort of uh, idea also that they're doing this cusp overlap technique and they're sort of putting the isolating non coronary cusp and doing the right and left cusp on top of it as they're deploying the valve and they're putting the, their valves higher and higher. They're lowering their pacer, pacemaker rates from 25% to like 8 to 10% ballpark and the, some centers have been able to do that. So that's all nice and great to put the valve up high. The problem with that is that if you have to do a valve and valve in the future, then you're sort of potentially running in trouble with you know, risking uh, the coronary occlusion you know, whenever you're going to do a valve and valve. And that is not insignificant. So this whole concept of lifetime management of aortic stenosis is really sort of being debated uh, around circles because you want to put the valve lower then so that you can do a valve and valve in 10 years, let's say, but then you put a pacemaker in the patient. If you put the valve too low, so then you're running this, you know, this 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 competing interests of okay, I don't want to put a pacer, but I don't want to, you know, I want to be able to do a valve and valve in ten years. So it's always this debate, and then there's and but then you have to look at the CT. If I if somebody you know it has a high coronary, is that I can say you know what I'm going to put the valve high because I'm not going to obstruct anything. I'm going to come back to a valve and valve. Or you can say, okay, well, these coronaries are a little bit low, borderline, so I need to put the valve a bit lower. I'll accept the risk of putting a pacer in now as opposed to having to do surgery, you know, when the patient is 85 years old. You know, so it's sort of a little bit uh, moving target, unfortunately. It's, it's always an ongoing struggle and debate uh, that we always discuss in the morning. Because lifetime management is a big deal, actually, because uh, these patients are, some of them are coming back, you know, and then uh, well, like, well, you know, like the last thing I want to deal with personally, it actually would make my heart sink is, well, you know, you put this valve in, now I'm older, now I have to have surgery. Well, I should have had surgery when I was younger. Well, I agree, maybe some patients should just have surgery young and they're younger, you know. Uh, but also that we don't know what the future holds. You know, there's a lot of devices are being uh, tested and trialed. You know, there's basilica technique. If the valve is going to be occluding the coronary, then maybe you can cut the leaflets. There's electrocardial leaflets. They're coming up with new devices that you can actually slip, slip the leaflets. Maybe you can core out the valve and keep the frame and use that frame as a, uh, you know, as a landing zone. There's new devices I'm sure are going to come. So maybe in 10 years, we'll have these, uh, you know, techniques to uh, get away from valve map or the coronary occlusion problems. But Right now, it's sort of in, in the process of being designed and developed. OK. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Artoy. All right, thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks for coming.